Hello class, Dr. Lyons here. And in this chapter, we're going to talk about microbes and how uh, microbes evolved and kind of where they, they came from. Uh, this picture is a picture from, uh, from Yellowstone National Park. This is what's known as the Grand Prismatic Geyser. Uh, and we'll be coming back to that later. Okay, because we're talking about the evolution of microbes, we are essentially talking about the origin of life. Uh, because life started with with microbes, with very simple organisms, and then got more and more complex over time. So this is showing a two-scale uh, representation of different key events in the, the history of our Earth. Right, so our Earth formed somewhere around four and a half billion years ago. Uh, it was about three and a half billion years ago that the first microbes, prokaryotes, uh, uh, first showed up on the scene, or at least that's when we have uh, the first fossil evidence showing them, them being around. Uh, it was about 1.8 billion years ago that eukaryotes showed up. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the difference between these two things. We'll talk a little bit more later about them. Uh, but the key difference between them is that eukaryotes are more complex and have a nucleus with DNA inside, uh, whereas prokaryotes, way less complex, no nucleus. Okay, so we've got single-celled prokaryotes three, have, three and a half billion years ago. Then the eukaryotes came along uh, about 0.6 billion years ago. So that's 600 million years ago. Uh, we see the first complex multi-celled life. So that's when life took the big leap from being single-celled in the form of single-celled uh, uh, prokaryotes or eukaryotes into multi-celled living things. About half a billion years ago, uh, land was first colonized by plants and then later by animals. Uh, it was about 0.18 billion years ago that dinosaurs came along. They then went extinct 0 0.06 billion years ago, so 60 million years ago. Uh, and it was only very, very recently that our species came around. Uh, so we are 0.000195 billion years old as, as a species, whereas prokaryotes have been around for three and a half billion years. Right, so we are actually a very, very young species. We've been around for 195,000 years, uh, as opposed to three and a half billion years like some other things. Okay, so let's talk about how those first microbes might have formed. So there are four very crucial steps that had to take place uh, in order for this to happen. The first crucial step is that, uh, is that organic compounds had to form spontaneously. Right, so we are made of, of organic compounds of things like amino acids and nucleotides and simple sugars and lipids. Right, we talked about all this stuff back in chapter three when we talked about macromolecules and, and, and the molecules of life. So these organic compounds had to form. Right? Amino acids and nucleotides had to form spontaneously and they then had to be bound to each other to make polymers, which is then going to be the next step of, of this process. So there's a couple of ideas about how uh, things like amino acids and nucleotides might have formed spontaneously on the Earth. So probably the one of the most uh, famous experiments in science was a, uh, a simulation experiment that was done in the 1950s. Uh, and in that experiment, they essentially simulated the conditions that would have been occurring on the planet, you know, back three and a half billion years ago uh, when the first life was forming. So life on the planet looks uh, kind of like this, right? There was a lot more volcanic activity. There was a lot more meteors. Uh, it was a very inhospitable place for, for present day uh, life. Uh, and so some researchers essentially simulated that uh, in the lab to see what would happen. So they had a sea of boiling water because, you know, back then the, the earth was very hot and so the, the oceans were boiling. Uh, so you had this water vapor going up into the atmosphere. Uh, and at that time, the atmosphere was kind of different from the atmosphere we have now. So today our atmosphere is primarily in the form of oxygen uh, in nitrogen gas, uh, and then some carbon dioxide, and then some other trace gases. Whereas back then, uh, the, the atmosphere was filled with hydrogen gas, so that's H2, it was filled with methane, uh, and was filled with ammonia, right? So the atmosphere back then would not have been very useful for us breathing. Uh, in fact, all these gases are deadly to us if we breathe them. 
Uh, and in the atmosphere, because of, because of you know the gases that were in there and the, and the climate on the Earth at that time, there was a lot of uh, uh, there was a lot of electricity. There was a lot of lightning, uh, which still, of course, exists today. Uh, and and back then, you know, three and a half billion years ago, there would have been rain just as there is today. Uh, so they they used the condenser in order to cool off the air. Uh, that makes uh, uh, this water go from a vapor into a liquid. So you have rain falling down uh, and going back into the sea. So you have kind of this loop where water is boiled and goes up into the atmosphere and mixes with these other gases and with electricity and then in the form of rain falls back down. They would then take some of that water out of those, those samples. Uh, and the really neat thing that they found uh, was that in this sample that then they would take out and, and analyze, they found amino acids and they found nucleotides. So they actually found some of those key monomers that, that living things depend on, right? So we need amino acids for making proteins and we need nucleotides for making DNA. Uh, and it seems like the early conditions on Earth uh, would have been really good for those things forming spontaneously. Uh, so that's how those things might have came about. Uh, another idea about where those organic compounds may have come from uh, has to do with this ecosystem that you're seeing right here. Uh, so this is what's known as a deep sea hydrothermal vent. Uh, so these are in uh, really deep parts of the ocean. Uh, they're in places where there's a lot of geological uh, activity underwater. Uh, they're like little underwater volcanoes, essentially. Uh, and out of these underwater volcanoes, you have this stuff that looks like smoke. It's not actually smoke because it's underwater. Uh, but you have this, this, uh, this liquid coming out of here that's full of different chemical compounds. Uh, and what you find inside of uh, this whole ecosystem are these very ancient types of archaea. So ancient, what, what, are, what are types of, of prokaryotes? So some of the most ancient life forms are actually found in this ecosystem. So it is thought that perhaps the, the chemicals that are present in these areas, uh, in the very hot temperatures that you have here, because it is volcanic, uh, perhaps those conditions would have been good for organic compounds uh, synthesizing. So that's a, another I idea. Uh, a third one, believe it or not, is meteors. So organic compounds have actually been found in meteors that have crashed uh, to the earth. Uh, of course, this is gonna be one of the great mysteries for a long, long time because uh, it's really hard to piece together things that occurred you know, three and a half billion years ago. Uh, but these are some, some kind of working hypotheses as to where things like amino acids and in, in, uh, in, in nucleotides might have first come from. So we know that amino acids and nucleotides are great, uh, but what we actually need are proteins and we need DNA and RNA, right? So we need, uh, we need those things to be formed into polymers. So inside of living things, the, you know, those amino acids and nucleotides are put together by those living things to make polymers, to make proteins and to make, uh, and to make DNA. But there must have been some way for this ha to happen spontaneously before, before life began, essentially. Uh, and so there's some ideas about how polymers could have formed spontaneously once there was amino acids and, and, uh, and nucleotides around. So one idea has to do with evaporation. Uh, it has to do with the fact that when water evaporates, uh, the solute that was inside of the water, uh, it actually stays and gets concentrated on, on surfaces. Uh, so a good way to think about this is, is with the ocean, right? So all of the, the rain that falls onto the, to the planet or a lot of the rain that falls onto the planet, certainly all the rain that falls here in Los Angeles came from the ocean, uh, that, uh, that water evaporates off of the ocean, goes up into clouds and then falls back to earth in the form of rain. Uh, but all of you know that rainfall is not salty, even though that rain is water that came from the ocean. So essentially what happens is when water evaporates, it leaves behind the solute that is dissolved inside of it. Uh, and, and what has been found in labs is if you put a bunch of amino acids or nucleotides in water 
and evaporate that water off this off that surface then when you concentrate all those monomers uh, together because now the water is gone they will spontaneously bind to each other so you can actually get amino acids to bind with each other uh, and nucleotides to bind with each other uh, simply by by taking water and evaporating it off a surface uh, by concentrating the amino acids or nucleotides that are inside of that that water uh, and evaporating water would have been something that occurred a lot back in this time uh, because the earth was much hotter back then so there was a lot of hot surfaces and so water would be evaporating off of those surfaces uh, so it is thought that uh, that that with especially if, if if we accept the the hypothesis that that amino acids and nucleotides might have where they might have come from is just from forming spontaneously in the, in the atmosphere uh, you have that rainfall that has amino acids and nucleotides in it falling back to earth uh, it lands on hot surfaces that water evaporates back up into the atmosphere it leaves behind those amino acids or, or nucleotides and by concentrating them together they form proteins and they form dna uh, so this might be where things like dna and proteins came from so that is kind of those first two parts of of life originating kind of gets at how uh, how the how organic compounds might have formed uh, but of course living things contain organic compounds right so we are basically a big bag of organic compounds uh, so there needs to be something to put those organic compounds in so another really important uh, part of 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 life forming uh, is pre-cells meaning some sort of thing that has uh, a, a container in which to put those amino acids and proteins and in, in DNA uh, and it's been found uh, that if you take the components that make up our cell membranes so fatty acids they will actually form you know bubbles spontaneously uh, and it has to do with with uh, what's going on at a molecular level with fatty acids uh, essentially fatty acids have a part of them that are attracted to water and a part of them that are afraid of water so essentially all the parts that are afraid of water that want to get away from water they kind of turn in on themselves and the part that likes water kind of turns outward towards the water uh, and, and when you have that happening what what will occur spontaneously is that fatty acids will form little bubbles uh, and those bubbles are, are thought to be where cell cell membranes essentially came from uh, that if you have those forming spontaneously if you have them forming around polymers and monomers you essentially now have a have a, a sort of proto cell a sort of beginning uh, cell so cells are, are great uh, and cells that have amino acids and dna and such inside of them are great uh, but a very key part of our life is that things are able to replicate right so life is able to replicate itself right you can make more of yourself by reproducing uh, and your cells can make more of themselves by reproducing and our dna can make more dna by by self-replicating right so that the fact that that we can reproduce and that our cells can reproduce comes from the fact that that we have dna uh, that is able to be self-replicated uh, and so a molecule that can of which more can be made was a really key part of the, the origins of life on on our planet uh, so we know that uh, so we know that DNA is the self-replicating molecule that's really important to reproduction both for us and for our cells uh, however there is a little bit of a of a problem here uh, and the problem comes from the fact uh, that DNA is used to make protein right such as enzymes right so we learned all about that back in chapter 10 right you learned about how dna is transcribed into rna and rna is translated uh, into proteins uh, and one such protein that that is made in that process are enzymes uh, where the problem comes into place uh, is that enzymes are needed to make dna right so you need dna to make enzymes but you need enzymes to make dna but you need DNA to make enzymes, but you need enzymes to make DNA. So we have this sort of chicken and egg dilemma uh, because a chicken is needed to make an egg, but an egg is needed to make a chicken. Uh, 
and so where uh, and so where we think uh, or, so, or so how this kind of conundrum has been solved uh, is with something known as ribozymes. Uh, so not that long ago, these things called ribozymes were found. And so ri a ribozyme is a type of RNA. All right, so we've learned about a, a few different types of RNA so far. So we've learned about messenger RNA and we've learned about tRNA. Uh, so now we're going to learn about this other thing known as a ribozyme. Uh, and ribozymes will actually act as enzymes, right? So they're not proteins, uh, they're, they're actually nucleic acids, but they're nucleic acids that kind of fulfill the role of those proteins. Uh, and so it's thought that perhaps ribozymes might have been the first self-replicating molecules because they can make more of them of themselves, right? So that is the, the current hypothesis on how that happened. So kind of to summarize, right? So how life needed to, like the four key steps that would have needed to take place for life to originate is that you have to have monomers forming, things like DNA, or I'm sorry, things like amino acids or, uh, or nucleotides. You have to combine those things together to make polymers you got to put them inside of something to make a, a cell. Uh, and those cells have to be able to replicate themselves by using some molecule that can self-replicate. Uh, in this case, we, we think what happened was that ribozymes were, the, the, were what were originally used. And then ribozymes gave way into other types of RNA, and then RNA gave rise to things like DNA. Okay, so we're going to spend the rest of this chapter talking a little bit about uh, two types of microbes, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about the prokaryotes, and then we'll talk about the microbe versions of eukaryotes. So, uh, so first, just to reiterate, the main difference between these two groups uh, is that prokaryotes lack a nucleus uh, in which to hold their DNA, whereas eukaryotes have a nucleus that they store their DNA inside of. Uh, and so prokaryotes are the most ancient uh, forms of life on, on the planet. All right, so they are very, very simple, and life started in very simple ways. Uh, some of them are extremophiles, and that's where this picture comes into place. So like I was saying before, this is a picture I took in, um, in Yellowstone National Park, uh, which is a, a very geologically and volcanically active part of North America. Uh, inside of this water, uh, you have microbes that are living in this water that is super, super, super hot, right? So this water is hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but yet you have my microbes, uh, prokaryotes, living inside of this water. So those are what are known as extremophile prokaryotes, right? So extreme, the prefix means extreme, and phyles means to love something. So they love extreme conditions. Uh, so there are some prokaryotes that are like that. There are some prokaryotes that are pathogens that cause disease, right? So, uh, so something like Borrelia is a type of prokaryote that causes Lyme disease, uh, or something like Streptococcus is a is a bacteria that that, that causes you to have the the common cold. Uh, so these so pathogens are things that cause disease. Uh, however, not all pathogens are bad, and not all path I'm sorry, not all prokaryotes are bad, and not all prokaryotes are extremophiles. Uh, in fact, most of the prokaryotes that are inside of us are actually uh, either benign, meaning they have no negative effect on us, or they are actually beneficial. They can be useful to us uh, in certain ways that we'll, we'll talk about in a, in a minute. So the, the so prokaryotes have a few different, uh, there's a few different ways that they're really useful to us, right? So they're useful for breaking down dead cells inside of our bodies. Uh, they're very useful inside of our digestive tract for breaking down food. Uh, so, so for instance, uh, you've probably you know heard of or seen you know foods that are considered probiotic. Uh, what that actually means is that those foods have the bacteria in them that are useful to have inside of our digestive tract. That are useful for uh, for for us for breaking down food uh, inside of us. So this includes a lot of, uh, of fermented varieties of food, right? So things like kimchi, things like, uh, like yogurt uh, that, are, that are fermented using a bacteria known as lactobacillus, uh, those foods tend to be very probiotic. So they have live bacteria in them that are good for us to have inside of our guts. Uh, 
Uh, bacteria uh, uh, or prokaryotes in general uh, can also be really good for guarding against pathogens. You know, so we all have tons and tons of prokaryotes living inside of us. Uh, and like we were saying before, most of those prokaryotes are either benign or actually beneficial to us. Uh, and so for them, they want to keep us healthy because they've got a really good thing going for them, right? They've got a nice little place to live inside of our bodies. So a lot of prokaryotes that live inside of us will actually fight off infections uh, because they don't want some foreign pathogen coming in and messing up the, the good thing that they have going for them. So some prokaryotes are actually useful in guarding against pathogens. From a kind of whole earth perspective, uh, a lot of prokaryotes are really important to, uh, to the cycling of carbon throughout, uh, throughout the planet. Uh, and that's because a lot of prokaryotes are decomposers, meaning that they will break down dead things. Right? So, so the, how the carbon cycle works kind of in general is that carbon is in the form of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, we learned back in chapter 7 uh, the plants take carbon dioxide and they use photosynthesis to make sugars from it. Things come along and eat those plants. Other things come along and eat those things. Uh, and when these things die, they don't just stay on the ground, you know, as dead things. Uh, they break down, right? We know that dead things degrade and break down over time. And why they do that is because of decomposers like, like prokaryotes. Uh, and so when those things die, you know, microbes eat those things. Uh, in those microbes, uh, like us, use cellular respiration, which we learned about in chapter six. Right? So cellular respiration is breaking down food, uh, using oxygen to do so, and releasing carbon dioxide as a byproduct of it. Right? So when things die, microbes eat those things and release carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. And that starts the whole cycle over again, where carbon dioxide goes into plants through photosynthesis, Animals come along and eat those plants, those animals die, and then microbes eat those dead animals and release carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. So prokaryotes are a very important part of the, the carbon cycle on our planet. Okay, there are three kind of categories of prokaryote shapes. Uh, and and the, the, the names of these shapes, you know, might sound familiar to you. Right, so there is the, the cosi shape, which is spherical, like these ones that you see here. Right, so any bacteria that has cosi in its name is a spherical thing. So like streptococcus or, or uh, you know, streptococci uh, would be one, one individual cell of streptococcus. Uh, so that is a, a chain of spherical shaped bacteria. So the strept part means a chain and the cosi part means spherical. So streptococcus is uh, are chains of spherical bacteria. Uh, bacilli are like these ones that you see here. So they're rod shaped or kind of sometimes thread like or maybe even filament like. They're elongated, right? They're not in a circle like, co like cosi, they're in a, in a long shape like this. So like lactobacillus, for instance, uh, is uh, is, a, is the bacteria that is used for making uh, yogurt, it's used for making kimchi, it's used for making uh, a lot of other fermented things, it's used for making sourdough bread. Uh, Lactobacillus is a, is a rod-shaped bacteria. Uh, and then finally we have the spiral-shaped prokaryotes that kind of come in this, this long uh, kind, of, kind of corkscrew shape. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how prokaryotes reproduce. So they kind of reproduce uh, for the most part through what's known as binary fission. Uh, so that's where, uh, where they, they basically grow to a big enough size that they can split apart uh, and now there's two of them. Uh, it is something kind of similar to mitosis that you learned about in chapter eight. Right, so mitosis is where, where a cell gets big enough and it, and it re reproduces its DNA and then it splits in two. Uh, what makes prokaryotes different from the rest of us is that when they do binary fission, when they, when they undergo this mitosis-like process, they can do it incredibly quickly. Right, so, so prokaryotes can reproduce as quickly as every 20 minutes, which is, you know, which is pretty fast. When you consider like us humans, you know, it takes us you know, we, we can't reproduce until we're like, I don't know, like 13 or 14 years old. Uh, 
uh, whereas they can reproduce after they've been alive for just 20 minutes. Uh, and there's a couple of ways that prokaryotes are able to produce genetic variation, right? So we learned back in chapter, uh, let's see, we learned back in the, in the evolution chapter, chapter 13, uh, the genetic variation is a key ingredient, ingredient for natural selection and for genetic drift, right? So you need genetic variation for those things to happen and for a population to change. Uh, and so it's really important for, for prokaryotes to make genetic variation if they want to be able to evolve. Uh, and so prokaryotes have spontaneous mutations just like us, right? So they have, you know, something like RNA, uh, something like DNA and RNA polymerase that can mess up just like our RNA and DNA polymerase can mess up, right? So spontaneous mutations can occur, but they can also do something where they kind of swap DNA with each other. Uh, in some in a process that is kind of similar to sexual reproduction, like like sexual re, sexually reproducing organisms like us do. Uh, and so what a lot of prokaryotes can do is simply by touch, they kind of touch each other and kind of make a bridge to each other uh, and they will swap around pieces of DNA with each other. Right. So what that would look like if humans could do that. Uh, would be, you know, say you, you go up to, to, I don't know, a friend or a family member, you just touch fingers with each other, and now you've kind of swapped some of your DNA, right? So some of your DNA is now in your friend's body, and some of your friend's DNA, DNA is now inside of your body, right? So they just exchange bits of DNA with each other, uh, which is crazy that they can do this. Uh, it's even crazier when you consider the fact that different species of prokaryotes can actually do that. Right. So that would be like you go up to your dog or your cat and you touch your dog or your cat and then you swap DNA with your dog and your, or your or your cat. Uh, so pretty crazy. They're able to do this. Uh, and the result of this is that is that prokaryotes can adapt to new situations really, really well. Right. So they can evolve into new conditions incredibly quickly. Uh, which is why inside of our kitchens, we take very great measures in order to slow down the adaptation and the reproduction of prokaryotes, right? So, so we pretty much all at home have a refrigerator. Uh, and what that refrigerator does is it slows down the rapid splitting of prokaryotes, right? So instead of being able to split every, say, 20 minutes, they might be able to split, I don't know, once every few hours. So that slows it down. Uh, before we had refrigeration, people would salt, you know, their food. Uh, salt is another way of, 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 of slowing down the rapid splitting of, of prokaryotes. Uh, and of course, when we eat our food, you know, a lot of our food, we, we, we either cook or we wash first. Uh, and so that is, of course, you know, with the purpose of removing prokaryotes from our food. Because in fact, there are a lot of, you know, pathogenic prokaryotes that we don't want getting inside of us. Okay, so prokaryotes kind of get their nutrition through two different modes, right? So there are the heterotrophic uh, ones, right? So for instance, the, the various uh, uh, prokaryotes that will attack our foods, right? So they, they are heterotrophs, they are eating other organisms or eating dead organisms. Uh, and then there are the types that are autotrophic. So that's more like this one here in, in this picture, right? So this thing in this picture, this is known as cyanobacteria, uh, and they are autotrophs. And specifically, they are autotrophs that photosynthesize. Uh, so they use the sun uh, in order to make sugars, right? So just like, uh, just like plants do, like we talked about back in Chapter 7. Then there's another type of prokaryotes known as chemosynthesizers. So what they do is instead of using photons in order to synthesize sugars like photosynthesizers do, they use chemicals in order to synthesize sugars. Uh, and so this is another picture from a deep sea hydrothermal vent, right? So those were those uh, really hot volcanic like things on the bottom of the, the ocean where you have chemicals kind of spewing up out of the out of the sea floor. Uh, and in that really ancient variety of prokaryote that I, that I mentioned earlier uh, that live in, this, in these areas, those really ancient prokaryotes are chemosynthesizers. So they are taking the chemicals that are coming out of the seafloor and they're using those chemicals to create sugars. Uh, and all the other things that live in that area, 
are based on that, right? So like these worms, for instance, they don't act like normal worms. These worms have those chemosynthesizing uh, uh, prokaryotes inside of them, uh, and that's how they get their nutrition. And then other things come along and eat those worms, and then other things come along and eat those other things. And you have a whole, a whole ecosystem at the bottom of the ocean around underwater volcanoes where you have the whole thing based on chemosynthesis around very ancient types of prokaryotes that are taking chemicals from the water and they're using those chemicals to make sugars. Okay, so there are two kind of main categories of prokaryotes. So there are the archaea, uh, and those are the ones that you tend to find in the extreme conditions, right? So like the ones that, that I just mentioned that, that live in hydrothermal vents and chemosynthesize, they are archaea. Uh, and the ones that you find inside of uh, hot geysers, you know, like in Yellowstone National Park, those are archaea. Uh, and you can probably guess from the, the word archaea that they are very archaic. Those are the, the most ancient types of prokaryotes. So that's where, where life began is with those things. And the bacteria, those are the more common varieties of prokaryotes that, that we would that we would be occurring, that we would be seeing on a daily basis. Uh, and the type of prokaryotes that live inside of us are the bacteria variety. Uh, in general, you're not gonna have archaea living inside of you. Okay, so there there is uh a couple of bacteria that I thought I want to talk about in detail because they're kind of interesting for different reasons. Uh, one that I did want to talk about is what's known as MRSA, uh, which stands for methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Right, so the coccus part, you know, you, you now know that that refers to a sphere shaped uh, bacteria. So Staphylococcus aureus is one species of bacteria. Uh, methicillin. That should maybe sound like penicillin to you. Uh, and the reason why methicillin sounds like penicillin is because methicillin does a similar thing as penicillin. Uh, it is something that kills off bacteria, right? So methicillin, penicillin, doxycycline, these are all types of antibiotics uh, that are used to treat people that have bacterial infections that are doing harm to them. Uh, and so methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus uh, that is a strain of Staphylococcus that is now resistant to common types of antibiotics. Uh, and this is a really good example of artificial selection. Uh, basically, this is a super bacteria that is now resistant to many types of antibiotics. Uh, and the reason is because we have selected against those types of bacteria that are prone to methicillin and other types of antibiotics, right? So essentially we have weeded out and killed all of the really weak strains of Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, and what is, left, what is left are the varieties or the strains that, that are able to resist these types of antibiotics. And so this has become a, a pretty major problem uh, in, uh, you know, particularly in hospitals where you tend to find uh, methicillin resistant staphylococcus uh, because if you have these these bacteria that that can't be killed with common antibiotics that is kind of a dangerous thing because uh, what because what is now essentially happening is a sort of a sort of like uh, uh, like armed race uh, with the staphylococcus aureus and other types of bacteria where we create new types of antibiotics to kill them and then they become resistant to those types of antibiotics and then we have to come up with new types of antibiotics to kill those new ones. And then those evolve resistant to the new antibiotics. So it's this kind of continuing cycle uh, where every time we produce a new type of, of antibiotic, uh, these bacteria that are harmful to us, you know, will evolve resistance uh, to them. Uh, and so if you've heard of MRSA, that's, that's what this refers to, is a, is a type of bacteria that is bad for you that, that will resist most types of, uh, of antibiotics. Uh, Staphylococcus is the only thing that is now resisting antibiotics. Uh, there is even a type of chlamydia, so a type of sexually transmitted disease that is now resisting many types of, of antibiotics. Right? So be careful out there, kids. Okay, uh, 
So what we're going to talk about for the rest of this chapter is some of the, uh, the, the more microbe types of eukaryotes. Uh, and so before we talk about eukaryotes, I want to talk a little bit about how they, they came about. Uh, so there's kind of two really important things that would have had to have occurred for those first eukaryotes to, to form. So one really important thing that, that had to happen uh, is a nucleus had to form. So we have a sort of ancient type of prokaryote, right? So that's what occurred first. Uh, essentially, what we know now is that the nucleus, the outer part of the nucleus, is made of the same material uh, as the outer part of a cell, right? So the outer cell membrane is the same material as the, the membrane around a nucleus. Uh, and essentially, what, what would have happened or, or how it's thought that the nucleus, the first nuclei formed, uh, is by parts of the plasma membrane kind of folding in on themselves uh, and surrounding that DNA. So it's thought that that is where where D, where the nucleus came from is is by parts of the cell membrane kind of folding in on themselves. Uh, where the the where this this orange thing and this green thing where they came from is by endosymbiosis. So you might remember back from chapters six and seven uh, that the uh, that the the organelle that is used in cellular respiration is the mitochondria, and the organelle used for for photosynthesis is the chloroplast. Uh, and so it's thought that those things come from endosymbiosis. So let's break down this word. So endo means inside, and symbiosis means two things living close with each other, typically in a, in a sort of agreeable situation, in a mutually beneficial uh, uh, situation. So it's thought that where present-day chloroplasts and mitochondria came from uh, is by ancient cyanobacteria and ancient bacteria uh, that got engulfed by larger eukaryotic cells. So essentially, a, uh, a small cyanobacteria gets engulfed by, uh, by a larger cell, uh, but instead of that larger cell digesting and eating it, it keeps it, it holds on to it. Uh, and now that cyanobacteria has a nice little home to live inside, and the sugars that it's producing, uh, some of those, the, this larger cell gets to use. Uh, and the same with, with ancient types of aerobic bacteria, right? So aerobic bacteria, meaning things that do aerobic respiration, like, uh, like what we talked about in, in chapter uh, six. Uh, and, uh, and so essentially the same thing could have occurred, that this ancient bacteria was engulfed by a larger cell, but instead of breaking it down and eating it, it held onto it. Uh, and so now that cell is living inside of this, this larger cell, uh, and it's making ATP for it. Uh, and so it's thought that this is how the, mito the mitochondria and the chloroplast were, were born. Uh, and so it, this essentially describes an endosymbiosis relationship where one organism lives inside of, the, of another. Uh, and like I said, this is where the mitochondria and the chloroplast are thought to have come from. Why we think this is the case is because those two organelles actually have their own DNA. Right, so up until now, when we've been talking about DNA, we've, we've really just been talking about nuclear DNA. So DNA that is found inside of the nucleus of eukaryotes. Uh, however, something that I hadn't told you until now uh, is that mitochondria and chloroplasts, they actually have their own DNA inside of them. Uh, and that would make sense given this hypothesis uh, that if these were once living, free living things, the, if the chloroplast and the mitochondria were once free living things, then in fact, they would have had their own DNA once upon a time. Uh, and they've just held on to that DNA, DNA through the millennia since they became uh, types of organelles. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about protists. Uh, because this is the, the only variety of eukaryotes that are unicellular, that, that are microbes. So protists themselves are very, very diverse. Uh, they're mostly unicellular, although there are some, some multicellular groups as well. Uh, so these are, are types of kelps, which are types of algae. Uh, so they are, of course, multicellular. Uh, but then there are uh, many, many types of single-celled uh, eukaryotes single-celled uh, protists. So a couple that I, that I wanted to talk about 
uh, include things that are autotrophic, right? So these are things that photosynthesize, like uh, like this thing, Calerpa, which is a type of green algae. There are also some protists that are heterotrophic that either eat other things or or eat the hosts that they live inside or they decompose dead things. So like this thing, Giardia is a type of parasite. This is something you definitely don't want to get inside of you uh, because it will eat you from the inside out and you don't want that happening. Uh, there are also protists that are mixotrophs, things that actually both photosynthesize and do heterotrophy. Uh, so this is what's known as euglena. It's a it's a fairly common thing to find like inside of freshwater ponds, uh, and it is uh, it's green, you know, because it has chloroplasts and it photosynthesizes, but it actually also eats things. So it does a mix of the, those two different things. Okay, I wanted to talk just briefly about some noteworthy uh, uh, protists. Uh, so giant kelp, I want to mention, you know, because for one, we can find them in our waters here in, in Southern California. Uh, and so these are the biggest of the protists. So they can get up to 150 feet long and can grow as much as two feet per day. Uh, so they are some of the fastest grow growing things on the planets, on the planet, I should say. Diatoms are another type of noteworthy protists. So these are of the single celled varieties of algae. Uh, they are really noteworthy because they are the, the most abundant uh, photosynthesizing organism on the planet. Uh, these things live inside of, mainly inside of the oceans, uh, and pretty much half of the oxygen that is in the atmosphere comes from these single cell diatom algae uh, because they're photosynthesizers, so they're creating oxygen. Right, so we tend to think of things like tropical rainforests as being the, the things that produce most of the oxygen in our atmosphere. But in fact, a lot of the oxygen is roughly half of it is coming from diatoms in the ocean. So they're the most abundant photosynthesizer on the planet. All right, so that's all I've got to tell you uh, about protists and about eukaryotes and the evolution of microbes. Uh, in the next chapter, we're going to talk a little bit about plants and where they came from.